thing, yeah. Yeah, it's on. <laughs> yeah. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.1, We know that if our earthly house, this tent, were to be destroyed, we have an eternal building of God in the heavens, a house not made with hands. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? From heaven's open door And I can't feel at home In this world anymore I have a loving Savior Up in glory land I don't expect to stop until with him I stand He's waiting now for me From heaven's open door And I can't feel at home In this world anymore Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you If heaven's not my home Then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. It was John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, who said, Our sins are many, but his mercies are more. Our sins are great, but his righteousness is greater. We are weak, but he is power. What love could remember no wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. As we constantly roam 
What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. He lavished on us. His blood was the payment. His life was the cost. We stood beneath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. And I was thinking to myself, how could I be worth that great a cost? And as the story was unfolding, I heard a voice like I had never known. That's when mercy called my name.
Well, good morning. I'm just making sure you're paying attention. I know what time it is. But I am glad to be in the house of God, aren't you? Amen. Amen. Just in the way of, uh, of announcements, I want to get that out of the way real quickly. Uh, if you have, uh, if you are looking to order CDs, you need to take care of that today. But I've also got wind that somebody has done something that I would, I would have done when I was in school. I would have turned my work in without a name on it. Somebody has turned in an order form for CDs without a name on it. So if you could make sure uh, with the folks that are collecting those order forms in the back, make sure that your name is on that, uh, that order form. That would be great. Otherwise, they'll have one just made without, without a home. And there's nothing more sad than a, CD, a set of CDs without a home. So, Folks, the word of God in Psalms 100 says this. If you'll give me just a moment, I could, I could quote it, but I better not. And I had it marked, and my humanity has flared up, so I apologize. Psalms 100 says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he, has, he is God, and it is he that has made us, and not we ourselves, that we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful for him and bless his name. And then it gives us the reason to do that. It says, for, his, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth unto all generations. Amen. Now understand that first verse says make a joyful noise. That's where I get to come in. I don't sing. I don't sing well. And, no, and everybody knows that. But the fact is, the fact is making a joyful do well, noise doesn't mean it has to come from the voice. I can do this. I can stomp my feet. I can even shout. And if I can do all of those things, so can you. So again, as we, as we get ready to worship after a prayer of invocation, I want you to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. That doesn't mean to shatter somebody else's eardrums with your voice, but make it some kind of noise in excitement and, and joy and service to the Lord tonight. Would you stand, please? Father, we are grateful for your goodness and grace. We thank you, Lord, that your mercy endures forever. But, Lord, we also understand that tonight we have come together this evening. Many of us have, have been here all week long, and, Lord, it is, it is just simply good to be in the house of God tonight. Lord, we ask that you'd bless those who would participate in any way, whether it's through the singing, through the, uh, through, the, through the preaching, through the giving, whatever aspect of worship we have opportunity to take part in. We ask that you bless our efforts this evening. Ask again that we would sense your presence, know that you are here among us, and, that, and help us to know that you are here among us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good evening. So glad you're here again tonight. And uh, we've come together to worship the Lord. Let's begin with this great hymn. When we all get to heaven, we're going to sing and shout yeah. the victory. Let's sing together on that first verse. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see jesus we'll sing and shout the victory while we walk the pilgrim pathway clouds will over spread the sky but when traveling days are over not a shadow not a sigh when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see jesus we'll sing and shout the victory let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of him in glory will the tolls of life repay. 
when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see jesus we'll sing and shout the victory onward to the prize before us soon his beauty will behold soon the pearly gates will open we will tread the streets of gold when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see jesus we'll sing and shout the victory but until then my heart will go on singing until then with joy i'll carry on until the day my eyes behold the city until the day god calls me home there is coming a day when no heartache shall come no more clouds in the sky no more tears to dim the eye all is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore what a day glorious day that will be what a day that will be when my Jesus Jesus I shall see when I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be there will be no sorrow there looking forward to that no more burdens to bear no more sickness no pain no more parting over there and forever i will be with the one who died for me what a day glorious day that will be oh sing church what a day that will be when my jesus i shall see when i look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be amen what a day what a day that's going to be i heard an old preacher say one time i'm not looking for the undertaker i'm looking for the upper taker i like it i like it right there but in the meantime in this age of apostasy, in this age of a culture gone out of control, we need the gentle shepherd to come and to feed us and to lead us. So let's sing this as we prepare for prayer tonight. Gentle shepherd, come and lead us for we need you 
to help us find our way. Gentle shepherd, come and feed us, for we need your strength from day to day. There's no other we can turn to who can help us face another day. Gentle shepherd, come and lead us. For we need you to help us find our way. Prepare our hearts for prayer. If you have a specific prayer request on your heart tonight, would you just simply show that by the raised hand? Amen. God sees those hands and he knows. He knows what each one of them represents this evening. Tonight we are privileged and honored to have two Dr. Greens in the house. We have Dr. Velma Green, who is our state CWC president, or yeah, uh, coordinator, coordinator. Uh, and again, uh, she and her husband, who is also serving as the president of the Minister's Fellowship here in, in Congress and also the Men's Fellowship. Uh, throughout the uh, Commonwealth of Virginia for, uh, for the Church of God. I've asked him to come and share with us or, and come and, and lead us in our pastoral prayer this evening. Good evening to everyone. What a privilege and honor it is to be here in this congregation to my friend, Pastor Bobby Dunn, if I just may shared this when we were coming together, the association and the assembly coming together as one. We were working on that back in 1994, 96, 98, and finally came together around about 2002. I will never forget your pastor. We stood side by side and we embraced as we took the communion for the Church of God in Virginia to be one. Yes, Shall we pray? Amen. Father, we count it a blessing that we approach the throne of grace. We're thankful this evening for the love that you continue to give your people the directions through the Holy Word being spoken. And we are a better people tonight. However, we stand in the need of prayer. When we see and hear the news and read the newspaper, we are, our hearts are touched wondering what in the world is happening in a time like this. Those that are being killed innocently, hurt, robbing, etc. That's not what you intended for this world to be especially with Christians in this world. But we ask tonight, Father, that you continue to give us your grace. Continue to give us your mercy, even your understanding, Father, because still, as we live, you have charged us to go ye into all the world share the gospel with every creature. That's our responsibility. 
help us to do so. In the world that needs the Bible, in the world that needs a friend, what a friend we have in Jesus. In the world where we can sing this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Give us the energy. Give us the mind. That yes, we are saved. We have accepted Christ as our personal Savior. But help us, Father, to reach out. Yes. To reach out. Maybe someone on our jobs. Maybe someone where we are working out at in the basketball, football, in the physical ed room. Somebody that don't know Christ. Help us to reach. So then when that great getting up morning comes yeah. that we are all are waiting for, a great morning when you come for your children. Oh, what a sight it would be if every last one of human beings were able to be ready. But for those of us who have accepted Christ, May we, again, encourage others. We bring our leader, our president, our vice, the cabinets, the senators, the congress, even the governors, mayors. They all need our prayer. May you give them wisdom, wisdom to guide people. And so far that this camp meeting, this indoor, thank you for those who have labored and shared the word of God. And as we prepare for tonight, may you be with that person as he delivers. Again, we said thank you for your love. Thank you that one day we heard the word. Maybe didn't under, quite understand it all the way that same day, but by and by we learned more and we are blessed people today. This little light of mine, yes, we will continue to let it shine. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Folks, this is another aspect of the service we get to participate and worship in. I'm going to ask our ushers, if they would, to come forward. We'll be waited on for tonight's offering. Uh, while they're coming, I want to encourage you and want to challenge you that, uh, that just, like, just like the cost of groceries and gasoline, the cost of everything has gone up. So we want to encourage you to give and, and to give generously. We want to encourage you to give in such a way that, that we will have a good launching pad financially for next year's indoor camp meeting. Some of the funds that are raised this evening and throughout the throughout our unity services throughout the year. Uh, that's where that money goes. But again, if we can get a great launching pad tonight, I would certainly appreciate that. But Harold, would you offer a prayer for our offering, please?
last night my brother mentioned Haddon Robinson and he mentioned that one of the things that he struggled with was what was pride and envy both spectrums of that of that pendulum tonight I'm not wrestling so much with pride but I am wrestling with envy throughout the course of the week I have been uh, and we have been brought into high spiritual places through the worship of our brother. Have you enjoyed Brother Ben Liston? Amen. 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 I have also been envious of my brother who can go to the front of the pulpits and with such confidence be able to proclaim the word without notes. I've, I, I can appreciate that. I, it does. It does. Makes you want to slap him hard. Yeah. Twice. Yeah. <laughs> but again, I am, uh, 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 I kind of joke about the envy part, but there is some truth to that, that, that when we see the gifting of others, we recognize that all of us have a place in the kingdom of God. Amen. Myself my, and both my brothers. And again, it's just, it's just been good to be here this week. Amen. So I'm going to uh, get out of the way get myself out of the way and, and listen and be prepared for what God has in special from Ben and uh, from Brother Nate. God bless you. Well, I will say it has been a joy and an honor of mine to be with you this week. And uh, it's always a joy to be with Dr. Leisure and um, he's, he's a good fella. He's a good preacher, an anointed preacher. And uh, we need good preaching. Amen. Uh, but thank you to the association for your invitation. And I hope you've been encouraged and blessed. And I want to leave you this week with this thought. Many trials are through Too many tears Help me to remember There's just too much to gain To lose Cross the hot, burning desert, struggling the right road to choose. Oh, but somewhere up ahead, there's cool, clear water. And defeat is one word I won't use. Too many sunsets lie behind the mountain. Too many rivers my feet have walked through. And there's too much to gain, to lose. We shall behold him. We shall behold him. Face to face. 
in all of His glory. We shall behold Him. Yes, we shall behold Ben, you've been a blessing to us this week. Praise the Lord. I want to thank those of you who have journeyed on with us throughout this week and made these services. Uh, you bless me. Brother Bob, there you are. Brother Bobby, Brother Jeremy. Good to be with my brothers in uh, the ministry. And again, I thank you for being here. This is a wonderful part of the country. This is a wonderful place. Dr. Green, Mrs. Dr. Green, you honor us with your presence today. Appreciate you being here. I think I told you the last time I was here, I live, I, and if I get my bearings, I live about 90 miles that way, I think. I think I do. Maybe it's that way. I live 90 miles from here. And so if you're ever in Greenville, Tennessee, you're traveling through, your car breaks down, or if you need a place to stay, you call me, you've got a friend, I will help you pray that you find a place <laughs> to stay. And I'll do for you. No, I'll, I'll help you. We'll, do, we'll, we'll work it out together, but... Uh, Look me up if you're in Greenville. I want to read to you from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 4, and then try to apply them to our lives this afternoon. But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name, you are mine. So when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burnt, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Since you are precious in my sight, you have been honored and I have loved you, and therefore I will give men for you and people for your life. This passage, uh, as I understand it, uh, is given uh, to us through Isaiah, who's speaking the words of our, of our Lord, and he's a prophet of our, of our Lord, and he is preparing the people to be invaded by Babylon. Uh, the people have sinned, the people have not lived according to the statutes of God. Uh, they uh, know that disaster seems, uh, seems pretty evident. The armies are on the move, and they have been praying to God to deliver them. They've been praying to God to forgive them, to cleanse them, and to get them out of the mess that they have largely created for themselves. And so God is speaking to them through this prophet. And they're crying out for deliverance. They're crying out for, uh, for forgiveness. And, uh, you know, whether their motives are entirely pure, they're asking for forgiveness, but they really want deliverance. And so 
the Lord says to them, listen, uh, you belong to me. I love you. Uh, you are my cherished possession. So when you go through the fire, know that I'll be with you. Now, that was a hard word from the Lord. Because here he is saying, I love you, you belong to me, but you're going through the fire. It's the same Lord that says, I lead you in the paths of righteousness for my name's sake. So, when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll be with you. I mean, we, we want the singing, but there's the sighing. We want the laughter, but there's the lamentation. We want the feasting, but there's the famine. The same Lord who says, you belong to me, I cherish you, says, yeah, but you're going through the water, you're going through the flames, but I'll be with you. Now, the question then is, well, why, if he loves us and cares for us, and he is reaffirming our value to him, why does he then say, but the fire and the flames are coming into your life just the same. And, and I think there are three simple reasons that we've hinted at throughout this week. The first is for our own benefit. There's something about the fires and the waters that we go through, the deep places, that both craft and cleanse us. They craft us. Um, see, w when I go through difficult places, or hard times, I'm tempted to say, Lord, if you're trying to teach me a lesson, why did you just not tell me? Why do I have to experience it? You could have told me. You could have told me that I was to this, and I would have fixed it. But you and I know that's not true, because he's already told us. It's in the book. But the problem is, is that we haven't been living the book. And I think the Lord looks at us and says, if just telling you would have made you be what I want you to be, maybe you wouldn't have had to go through it, but I've been telling you, and it hasn't crafted you like I want you to be. And that's true. It's not the word as much as the experiences interpreted by the word that shapes us. I mean, I played some sports with growing up, not any good at really any of them. I think I was the best at baseball and came to love baseball. But, but here's the thing about baseball, which is true of any sport. You don't get good at it in the classroom. You can read all the books about baseball you want. You can master the rule book, but that doesn't mean you can hit the curveball. To, to get good at baseball... It's important to know the rules. It's important to know proper strategy. It's important to know proper stance. But you got to get into the batting cage, and somebody has to stand there and say, you're dropping your shoulder. You're, you're coming too early. Your foot's out of line. The only way you really get good at baseball is through getting up and striking out and striking out until you finally learn how to hit it consistently. And even then you don't always hit it consistently. There are things that you can't learn without experiencing them. And, and if, if God wants to make us people who can ace a test on the Bible, that would be one thing. If all God wanted was for us to be able to, to, to master Bible trivia, that would be one thing. But what he's after is to get us where we master the art of living the Bible. And you don't master the art of living the Bible, particularly sitting here. You master it by going out, you face things, you face crisis, and then the Bible speaks into your life, others speak into your life. But it's the experiences that craft us as much as the Word. Now you have to have the Word interpreting and guiding you through the experiences. But having said that, you can't get crafted without the experiences. I have uh, four children. They sort of came at two different seasons in my life. One's, one set is four and six. The other set is 11 and 12. So we had, you know, a nice little gap there and then decided, surely we can do better than these two. And so we had, no, uh, 
but uh, but but the 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 older two particularly growing up they were fairly sensitive and uh, I wanted I you know particularly as they got into the older uh, the uh, later years and uh, in uh, elementary school, and then they were getting ready to go, to go to junior high, one's in junior high. I, I thought, you know what? These girls are going to get eat up if they don't get tougher skin. But y you, you, you can't get, uh, maybe it would work with your kids, but, but with my kids, I didn't feel like I could sit down and verbally give them tougher skin. I couldn't sit down and say, no, you know, people are going to insult you. Junior high is a jungle, and uh, middle school is a jungle, and uh, people say mean things about you, but they don't know you. They don't understand who you are, so just let it go off your back. Ignore it. Stand up for yourself. I, I just didn't think that I could guide them through the process with teaching. And one day, I, I, something crossed my mind, and it's like, I'm just going to have to toughen them up. And this is probably really bad parenting, and I'll know that 20 years from now. But I thought, I'm just going to start insulting them. I, I, I got to toughen them up. And so their bedroom is, is next to, to ours. Uh, at that point, my wife was sleeping down the hall with the kids until she got them to sleep, and then she would come, come uh, to, she, she's really sleeping in all the beds all over the place. And, uh, and, uh, so I would go by their open door to my room, and one night I went through, and I said, good night, booger breaths. And I went to bed, and I heard them get up, and I heard their little feet run down the hall, and they tattletailed on me to my wife. <laughs> Got their feelings hurt. Next night, it's like I went in, and it's like, good night, you couple boneheads. I heard, da -da -da -da, and they tattletailed on me. It took several nights and into the weeks where I could say, hey, good night, knuckleheads. And they would say, good night, booger breasts. And I, I felt, well, now I'm getting somewhere. But, but I don't know that I could have taught them that. Now, my, my son, it, it's, uh, he's four. He, he does a little better. I, uh, I, yesterday, I, I, uh, he came through wearing his Batman underwear. And I said, uh, how you doing, wedgie man? Guys, he's at a wedgie. And he came over and looked me in the eye and said, pretty good buck teeth. <laughs> like, this kid's ready for school. This kid's ready to go. <laughs> Not going to get ran over. Um, but, but you got to have the experience. Let me put it to you in theological terms. Jesus said that uh, hearts are like soil. And you got your hard soil. Uh, and nothing's going to grow in the soil. You got your thorny soil. And uh, thorns, it's like the gospel goes into those hearts, cares of the world choke. Uh, and he said you got your rocky soil. And that's bad soil too because things don't get very shallow. He said, but you ha do have some good soil in which things grow. Now, uh, I'm applying this maybe in a way that Jesus didn't intend. But when you look around, uh, when you drive by a farmland, What's the soil that's ready to have something grow in it? It's the plowed soil. The stuff you got to plow in. And, and I think that's an application for you and I. The best soil is the soil that's had a plow driven through it and tilled it up and moved it around. And, and in my mind, that's what life experiences do. They're intended to plow us up so good things can grow in us. I started out in pastoring. My dad uh, had pastored before me, and he mentored me before and then after I started. And, and I would get frustrated because I would say, Dad, these people, people I'm pastoring, they're, they're living these haphazard, careless, uh, nominally Christian lives, and I just want to grab them by the neck and tell them to straighten up. And he would say, Son... You'll accomplish nothing by doing that. <laughs> Their life is too good. You're not going to tell them anything as long as life is going good for them. You've got to wait for life to crash in on them. 
They're going to lose somebody they love. They're going to lose the money. They're going to get a diagnosis from their doctor that's very devastating, and they'll come to you, and then you can talk to them. But until life roughs them up a little bit, they aren't going to listen to a thing you say. You just got to wait. And that's true, isn't it? The, when the plow goes through our lives, it makes us soil that can grow good things. It begins to make us pliable where we can be crafted. But it takes the difficult places in life. I wish that I w was strong in the faith, that I had courage, that I had great faith, that I had great obedience, that, that I was pursuing holiness as I should have just by reading the books. But I know it didn't come from the books. I know that it came through some difficult places God brought me into and then brought me out of. So not only, not only does the fire and the water craft us, but, but then secondly, it also cleanses us. Because I think when Israel would have heard, uh, I'll bring you through the waters, I think they would have thought about the waters that, that Moses led the children of Israel through. The children had been taught that from a young age. It would have been really embedded in their conscience. So when he says, I'll bring you through the waters, I think they would have thought about the exodus from Egypt. But what do we know about the exodus from Egypt? Well, they're being chased by the Egyptian armies. They come, the waters part. They go through the waters. The waters close. It destroys the army of the Egyptians. So in other words, the waters were, were a path of deliverance, but the waters were also the means by which their enemies were destroyed. And that's true in my life and your life. Going through the waters, going through the very hard places, have, they've got a way of killing our enemy. I mean, listen, Nebuchadnezzar, his great enemy was pride. You know how pride died in his life? He went through the deep waters. Seven years he was out there eating like an animal. But when he got back from being in those waters, that enemy had died in his life. The truth of the matter is, is that in our lives, oftentimes it wasn't reading the Bible that pride got hit. If, if we have any humility in us at all, it's probably more because we got humbled. It's not that we have humility, it's that we've been humbled. That's where it came from. But it comes again, and that's a great enemy, but it comes to the fire. There are guys, and maybe girls, but guys whose priorities are all over the place. They're uh, dedicated to their job. They're lousy fathers. They're not giving their wife priority. And they're living this haphazard life. And it's an enemy because their haphazardness is going to cost them the most valuable things in life. But then they go through the fire. <laughs> Maybe they lose the job. Maybe the wife threatens to leave them. Maybe she goes home to her parents. And in those fiery moments, the thing that is really disrupting and destroying and will bring them to their knees gets killed. Their priorities get realigned. And amazingly, it was a tough time, but it actually was a cleansing time for that person. Again, we go through the fire. We face the losses. We go up against or go through those seasons of unpopularity. We face the failures that we brought on ourselves in so many cases. But God lets us go through them because they craft us, they cleanse us, they make us what the Word of God maybe should have made us, but for whatever reason, we didn't get the lessons in class, but we get them in life. Not only do the fires cleanse us, but they make us witnesses. You know what 2 Corinthians says. It says that, verse 3 of 2 Corinthians 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. So we go through difficult times. 
We go through hard places so that we have the capacity to comfort other people. And, and so, again, that's why you ought to be part of a church. The things I'm going through are intended to help me be a minister to other people. Now, that works both ways. Because you might be here and you're going through some difficult places of your own right now. It's a dark place. You're in the fire. You know what God has prepared for you? Other people who have gone through what you're going through. Other people are here to minister to you. Receive their ministry. It took me a while to understand that when I want to be a John Wayne Christian, I don't need anybody. I'm rejecting God. Because God ministers to me through other people. When I say, you know what, I don't want to go to an altar. I don't want to let people know sort of what I'm going through. I don't want to get up and tell everybody, I'm struggling, folks. I need your prayer. When I don't want to say that, when I just want to keep it to myself, I just, and I say, I, I just want to go to God. I'll, I'll, I'll get it from God. I think God is saying, no, you've got a church, you've got a body, you got a room full of people, and a lot of those people have gone through what you're going through just so they can comfort you. Go to the body, admit your faults, admit your need, and I'll work in you through them. And when you say, no, I, 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 don't, I don't want to bother anybody, I don't want to share this with anybody, you're not locking them out of your life, you're locking God out of your life. That's what you're doing. So we go through these things for our sake, for the sake of others. And again, thirdly, we go through them for the glory of God, right? I like how Isaiah 43 puts it. In verse 11 and 12, he says this. Um, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no other. I have declared and saved. I have proclaimed, and there is no foreign God among you. And therefore, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. You're my witnesses. Now he's prophesying to them. When you come through the fire, you'll be my witnesses. I got to bring you through the fire so you can testify that I can deliver from the fire. I got to send you through the waters so you can testify that I am the deliverer from the waters. You got to get in a problem so I can deliver you from a problem so that you can testify that I can deliver from a problem. It, this is the way it works. Remember, remember when Jesus is talking and they ask Jesus, this guy right here, he's been sick, paralyzed since, uh, since birth. Who sinned, his parents or him? And Jesus says, neither. This guy is in the shape that he's in to bring glory to God. He's this way so I can heal him so that you'll know the power of God. But you got to get sick before you can get healed so you can witness that God can save you. So he brings us in, and that's God's way. God, listen, God is trying to glorify himself in you and I. And so our weaknesses help him be glorified. That's why he chooses who he chooses. Not many wise, not many noble are chosen. You know why he maybe chose to use me? Because I'm stupid. That's why he chose to use me. If God uses you in any way, no, it's not because of what you are. It's because of what you're not. I mean, all through the Bible, people say, well, he chooses. Sometimes he chooses the younger or weaker. No. All the time he chooses the younger or weaker. I mean, look at it. It's Abel over Cain. It's Jacob over Esau. It's Joseph over his brothers. It's Joseph's younger son, was it Manasseh, over Joseph's younger son. It's Moses, who's three years younger than, than his brother. Uh, who's his brother? Aaron, that's right, Aaron. I knew that. I didn't know if you knew that. Aaron. <laughs> um, it's David over all of his brothers. It's, uh, it's Solomon over his brothers. It's always, always the one that's being discounted that God chooses to use. Did you ever notice in Luke chapter 3, it's a powerful passage. Anybody know where Luke is? But, oh, I found it. <laughs> um, just, just 
what Luke says. Now, now, get, now get, what, get what's being said here. It says in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. So in the 15th year of the emperor, Pontius Pilate being governor, Tiberius is emperor, now we got a governor, Pontius Pilate, being governor, Herod under Pilate, being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip being tetrarch of Atura, and the reign in the region of Trachonitis, and Lysantius, tetrarch of Abilene. So there's all the politicians that matter. Annas and Caiaphas, verse 2, being high priest in Jerusalem. So if God was going to call somebody to deliver and to be a spokesman, well, he'd go to the emperor, but he doesn't go to the emperor. Well, he'd go to the governor, he doesn't go to the governor. Well, he'd go to the tetrarchs, those guys under the governor. No, he doesn't go there. Well, he'd go to the high priest. No, he doesn't go there. Annas and Caiaphas being high priest, the word of the God came to John, son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. God loves doing that. I'll skip the emperor, I'll skip the governors, I'll skip all the other politicians, I'll go past the high priest, I'm going to the wilderness to the guy eating bugs and drinking honey. Something like that. That's God's way. Why? Because it glorifies him. That's why he does it. I mean, if God only chose the all-stars, you'd expect his team to win. But God revels in choosing all of the oddballs, the guys who didn't make the draft, the guys who didn't make the cut, and then when he puts them on the team and they win, praise be to God, they say, what a great coach, what a great God. So God, again, brings us into places. He, he, he looks at our frailty and he looks at us and, and he brings us into humbling places. And when he's got us right down to where we think we're about nobody, like he did with Moses. What did they say? First 40 years, Moses thought he was somebody. The second 40 years, he found out he was nobody. But then the next 40 years, he found out what God can do with somebody who finds out they're nobody. He brings us, he humbles us, he puts us in the fire. And then he says, I got you just about low enough. Now I can be glorified in you. He raises us up. Now I want you to see the promise in this. This is what I wanted to leave you with tonight. God says, you're going through the fire. I know you're sorry for what you did. I know you don't want to do that. But you're going in the fire. And you're going through the deep waters. But I will be with you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, neither shall the flame scorch you. You're going in, but you mark it down, you're coming out too. You're going into some dark places, you're going into some hard places, but you mark it down, you're coming out. I'm not sending you in to destroy you. I'm sending you in to bring you out. You're going in, but don't act like the grief that I'm in is going to crush me. You're going to come out. You're going into some difficult places, but you're not going to be destroyed. You're going in against some opposition, against some fiery people. You're going up against some giants, but you're not going up against them to be destroyed. You're going up against them to be delivered. That's my promise to you. Have you ever noticed how Moses preparing the people, preparing the people at the end of his life, and in Deuteronomy chapter 33, he says, verse 26, 27, he says, the eternal God is our refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. He will thrust out the enemy from before you and will destroy. That's beautiful. He says, our God's up there. He's a mighty God. He's a powerful God. 
But he's got long arms. He's got arms that reach right under you. You're not going to fall. You're going to be carried. You're going up against some enemies. You're going to take some mountains. You're going to face some giants. But there are everlasting arms under you. You are not going up against the fire to be destroyed. You're not going up against the mountains to be crushed. There are everlasting arms under you. I love how he says in a chapter earlier in chapter uh, in verse 11 of Deuteronomy 32. He says, as an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on their wings. So the Lord alone led him and there was no foreign God with him. Now think about that. He says, you guys are, 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 are like the, the little you guys are the little eaglets. And you and I are the little eaglets. And, and he says, he's drawing out this parallel. The, the eagle makes this nest. And it's a big nest. I mean, it's got branches. And, and you've seen those nests. And, and, and they're, 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 they're not a comfortable nest. So the eagle goes out. And the eagle kills animals, and she takes the coats of the eagle, or, or coats of the animals, maybe a squirrel, maybe, I don't know, can they, I guess they kill mice and rats, but, but I'm, thinking, I'm thinking a squirrel. And, and she, she puts all these comfortable uh, skins in her nest. And then she has her babies, and, and they grow up just in the lap of luxury, surrounded by those nice skins. I mean, have you ever seen, you know, like a beautiful thick rug, and you just lay there, and it's so comfortable. Well, that's, that's the life of an eaglet. So they never decide to fly on their own. Why would you leave the nest? Your mother's bringing you food. You're laying there in a, in a mink. I mean, you got the life. I mean, they'd say that if you take a little eaglet and you put it on the ground with a bunch of chickens, it will never fly. Never fly. So here are these little eaglets. All oh, they're surrounded by comforts, all these comforts. The Bible says that God stirs up our nest as an eagle. This is what the eagle does. The eagle comes in one day and says, enough is enough. They've been too comfortable for too long. They're never going to fly if they remain in this safe, secure, comfortable environment. So she takes her beak and she starts throwing the skins out. And she gets the nest down to where it's just a bunch of Again, uncomfortable branches and twigs that poke them in the little eaglet bottle. There's no place comfortable in that nest anymore. She stirs it up. And they get up on the edge. Now, now they're really uncomfortable. They're thinking, I wonder if there's a more comfortable nest somewhere. Maybe down there. And the mother gets up there and, and, and sort of acts like she's looking too. And then her wing sort of slips. And she knocks it out of the nest. And down it's going, it's like, holy smoke. But it says that the eagle flies down and comes up under it and catches it just as it's falling. And I'm sure the little eagle, you know, gets carried back up to the nest and he thought, boy, mom was clumsy. Wow, she just had a nervous twitch there. I don't know what happened. And, and she, she puts her right on the edge. And, and then as the little eagle is saying, thank the Lord for that, she hits him again and down he goes. And, and, but she keeps swooping under, and she catches it. Keeps bringing it up. This happens time and time and time again, till the eagle figures out, Mommy don't have no nervous twitch. This is on purpose. And, and, and it begins to flap its wings, and ultimately it flies. And Moses says, Israel, that's what God did to you. That's what God did to you. That's sort of the image. You were sort of comfortable in Egypt. You were slaves, but you didn't know it. 
but he brought you out in the wilderness to stir up your nest so that you can be all that you were meant to be because you weren't meant to be slaves. Now, he's doing that in my life and in your life. And you ought to know that because we live comfortable lives in America. If God loves us like he loves Israel, and he does, the promise is, is that he don't want us sitting around in half a million dollar houses watching Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy and Matt Locke and Murder, She Wrote and going to bed every night and getting up and drinking five dollar cups of coffee. That's nice. That's nice. But when you lay around in the nest and you enjoy the comforts, you know what you're doing? You are tempting God to stir up your nest. And the Bible does he say he comes in at some point, and I think it happens to churches, it happens to people. The comforts begin to fly. There goes the 401k. There goes the health. There goes the job. There goes the relationship. And all we got is a bunch of briars poking us in the rump, and we're saying, there's got to be a comfortable place somewhere. And just when we think it can't get any worse, whack, down we go. But there are everlasting arms. There's a mother hen that comes up. And you know what? As we depend on him, he never lets us hit the sidewalk and go splat. Always catches us. There's everlasting arms. There's a mother hen, and his name is Yahweh. He catches us every time just before we think we can't go any farther. We can't go any lower. The grief can't get any worse. The problems can't be any greater. He catches us. Takes us back up. At some point we find, you know what, I can fly. I can fly. But praise the Lord, I never hit the sidewalk. He caught me every time. I love this and you're worried I'm just about finished don't know what time it is I preach with a clock I can hit 32 minutes on each sermon I got a clock I don't know how long I've been preaching but this is what he says he says you can depend on me Israel to deliver you from the fire you can deliver me to bring you through because Israel Verse 3, I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Serbia in your place. You are precious in my sight. Now, we don't know exactly what that means. The best that biblical scholars can come up with is that Babylon, that massive kingdom that sent these hordes of, of invaders, invaded just not Israel, but they invaded the whole region. They went to Ethiopia and Egypt and, and Seba. They, they, they invaded the whole bloody region to conquer it. And, and perhaps what Isaiah is saying, the Lord is saying, is that you didn't get the brunt of it. Egypt got hit harder. Ethiopia and Seba got hit harder. They wore Babylon down, and they did that on purpose, so when they hit you, you just got the mild invasion. They got the rough invasion. And I let those nations wear them down so that you didn't get hit hard like maybe you would have thought. But, but he says, I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Since you are precious in my sight, you have been honored, and I have loved you, and therefore I will give men for you and people for your life. You know how I know that I'm coming through the fire, that I'm not meant to be destroyed? Because God gave somebody for me. He gave some people for Israel, but he gave Jesus Christ for me the ironclad guarantee that I'm not going to be destroyed, that I'm going to come through, that the hardness and the flames and the flood weren't meant to destroy me is because Jesus Christ gave his life for me. Listen, if Jesus Christ was going to abandon me, he would have done it in Gethsemane. 
That was hard for him. If he was going to walk out on us, he'd have done it in his Gethsemane. The reason I know he'll stick with me in my Gethsemane and bring me through is because he stuck with me in his Gethsemane. He went to the cross. He battled all the power of Satan on the cross. He took on all the powers of hell, all of the empires of his day. He stood up. He defeated them. And so I know in my life, when Satan comes in like a flood, he'll raise up a standard. He can beat Satan in his life. He can beat Satan in my life too. He can deliver me. He can bring me through. I'm not meant to be beat by grief. I'm not meant to be destroyed by opposition. I'm not meant to be brought low and left there. I am meant to be victorious in the end. And you got to believe that. I believe that. We all go through the fire. We all go through the flood. We all go through the waters. We all know what it's like to get our nest stirred up and thrown out of the nest. But praise the Lord if you believe in him. You also know what it's like to fall into the everlasting arms. You know what it's like to think this is the end of me, but somebody swoops in and saves you. Just as destruction looks certain, you're saved. We know what it's like to lose loved ones. And get to the place where we say, if something doesn't happen, I'm going to die. I can't live with this grief forever. This will kill me. Comfort does come. Everlasting arms do come under us. In the darkness of that night when we don't think we can go on much longer, strength comes. Strength comes. Stand with me. I wonder if tonight you're in that fire, you're in that flood, and you want to just come and pray, and again, it's a very holy thing to kneel down and say, Lord, help me to trust you. You haven't brought me to this place to destroy me. You've brought me here to bring me through. And, and as you pray that prayer, to allow others to maybe gather around you, give strength to you. I went through a time in my life uh, three years ago, difficult time, my father died, and, and, and I know that that isn't by any means the greatest loss somebody can experience in life. But it was the greatest one for me. He was my pastor, he was my best friend, and he was my father. I lost three men when he died. That was a very difficult time for me. I, re I remember um, when his death was certain and... The cancer had just about finished its work on him. I was waiting for my kids in line and uh, at school, and it, 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 hurt, it hurt so bad. And I knew the principal was a godly woman, and I just parked my car in line. And I went in there, and I shocked Diane Musgrove out of her socks. I came in, and she thought I was there to complain like every other parent. I said, Diane... I don't know if I can make it through this day. Will you pray for me? And, and, and I'd only known her two or three times, and, and she came over and put her hands on me and prayed for me, and then she looked at me and said, is that what you wanted? I said, That's what I wanted, prayer. I needed that. Uh, my wife, uh, 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 a couple years later, told me uh, that she had uh, online, she did an online thing. She said, I've got some custom masks made for the girls. Will you go by and pick them up? And I went by and picked them up, and I knocked on the door to get these masks to pay the woman. And out steps Diane Musgrove. She's making masks on the side. I said, Diane, how you doing? She said, I'm not doing well. I lost my dad a couple weeks ago. And she said, you remember when, you, when I prayed for you and you needed it? I said, I do. She said, well, you need to pray for me today. Come over here. And I laid hands on her in that drive, and I prayed for her. That's what God calls you and I to do. We're in the fire when the nest has been stirred up, when we're in the flames. 
kneel down and he say, Lord, help us. I'm not in this place to be destroyed. <laughs> it's the one thing I know. You didn't bring me here to destroy me. And you allow other people that God uses, maybe already been there, to speak into your life and minister. God gives you strength through them. And you keep going, and the fire doesn't last forever. The flood doesn't last forever. You find your strength again. I'm going to pray, and if there's anyone here, and maybe you've been coming each night, and uh, you say, why didn't that guy give altar calls? Well, I'm giving one tonight. Because I don't want you to leave this revival feeling the way that you do. But you're going to have to step out, and it's an act of faith. And you're going to have to maybe let somebody... Put their hand on your shoulder and pray for you. Now, if somebody comes in this altar call, don't you leave them hanging. Minister to them. Father, we thank you for this place, for this time together. Father, these are wonderful, wonderful people. I carry them in my heart. I look around this room and there are people who have ministered to me throughout this week. I felt a little tired at times and maybe they sense it and they've come up to me and they've encouraged me. I thank you for them. I hope that in a small way maybe they've got some encouragement themselves tonight. Father, I pray specifically for the person who is here today who is facing a hot fire, walking through some deep waters, that the words today might become personal to them, that they might claim them as their own. They are not meant to be destroyed. They're loved. They're cherished. The one who gave his son to save them from their sins is walking with them. He's alive. There are everlasting arms. And not only will he save us from our sins, he'll save us from the arrows and the darkness too. Now may they find strength in you, yes. But also may they find strength in the body that you have sent and that you've created to minister to each other. In the name of Christ Jesus, we ask it. Amen. God bless you tonight. If you have a need, don't you take that need with you. There's a Lord with everlasting arms who can help you. Amen. my Lord he taketh my burden away he holdeth me up and I shall not be moved he giveth me strength as my day he hideth 
with my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land he hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand with numberless blessings each moment he crowned and filled with his fullness divine I sing in my rapture O glory to God for such a redeemer as mine he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land he hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand when clothed in his righteousness poor did I'll rise to meet him in clouds of the sky his perfect salvation is wonderful love I'll shout with the millions on high and he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land he hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. Glad. I am certainly glad that I was here. In an event like this week, there are a lot of moving parts, a lot of a lot of different activities. We see, we, we see the chair, we see the, the the worship evangelist, we see the preaching evangelist, but there are those who don't always get recognized. And so I want to say thank you to Brenda Shook and Patty Hawkins. Also to Chris Poe, and Scotty Hopkins, and Laura Ann Arnold as well. These folks, again, have made the folks up here look good. I should say they made them sound good. Folks like me, you don't get to make it look good. Maybe sound good sometimes. But it's, again, it's, it, it's just been wonderful to be here. And again, I thank you for your presence. Thank you again for... The opportunity to, to, to be able to serve uh, each of you as, as a neighboring pastor. Uh, just good to be among the people of God. As we wrap things up tonight, I'm going to ask if the prettier of the two Dr. Greens would lead us in a closing prayer. Dr. Velma Green, would you lead us in prayer, please? <laughs> 